Okay, uh, I think it's time uh, to begin. So uh, my name is Barry Sander. I'm an assistant professor at Leiden University. Um, I'm one of the co-conveners uh, of this series, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the third day of the British Institute of International and Comparative Laws webinar series on teaching international law. We have a fantastic uh, set of webinars today. Uh, we'll be kicking off with our first one, which is the promises and perils of the pedagogy of international law in the Philippine state of exception. Um, and then later on, we'll be having a webinar on critical perspectives on teaching international law. Um, I'd just like to begin with a, a couple of thank yous. Um, first of all, thank you to uh, Bickle and their events team in particular, Liam, Bradley and Carmel. Uh, your support is absolutely invaluable uh, to making this all run smoothly. So thank you so much. I uh, would like to thank uh, our organizing committee who uh, kindly took part in peer reviewing all of the proposals um, and offering uh, advice and support on the concept more generally. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who submitted a proposal uh, to the webinar series. Um, thank you so much. It's a shame we couldn't uh, you know, accept all proposals. We had such a high uh, demand, uh, but we accepted uh, what we could. I'd like to thank uh, today's panelists in advance. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to attend and give your presentations. It's very much appreciated. Uh, thank you to our chairs. Uh, and most of all, I guess, thank you to everyone in our audience today. Um, it's fantastic to see such a large group of you. Um, I very much hope uh, you enjoy uh, the experience. And I'll now hand over to Jean-Pierre to take you through some logistics. Thank you very much, Barry, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us again. Um, yeah, so just two very quick points in terms of logistics. So the first is um, about questions. So please do ask questions as you go via the Q&A box, which you can see on your screens. Um, and the second point related to that is that you can upvote questions that you would like to see answered uh, during the discussion. We cannot promise that we will get to all of them. However, we will try our very best to make sure that you get an answer to your questions. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention as well is that the recordings of these webinars are being uploaded onto the Bickle website. So um, they can be seen, uh, could, they can be watched after um, today's session as well. The only other thing that I wanted to do is to introduce very briefly the chair of this first webinar of today, and that's Dr. Irini um, Antonopoulos who is a lecturer at Royal Holloway University of London, as well as being a visiting fellow at Bickle. Uh, Irini, thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Barry, and welcome, everyone, and good morning and afternoon, as our speaker said. Um, today, obviously, the, the theme is very, very interesting, and we have a set of speakers that will kind of walk us through the pedagogy of international teaching, international law in the Philippines, and um, some of the history of some of the challenges and some of the futures that they foresee uh, in teaching international law in the Philippines. And I will start with um, Romer Recalado Bagares from the Lyceum Philippines University College of Law. Um, who will discuss teaching international law in Philippine law schools in light of the challenges uh, that the change of administration brought um, to the Philippine post-colonial constitutional project. Um, and over to Romo. Good morning to our friends in London and good evening to those watching from the Philippines. This presentation is entitled Between History and Pedagogy Hard Lessons from Philippine Territorial Limits Post-Colonial Discontents. In my paper, I examine how Philippine colonial history had shaped and directed the Filipino national territorial imaginary. My central thesis is that teaching in Philippine classrooms of positivist doctrines on the international law and territory needs to take a careful account of what is at the heart of this national territorial imaginary. The long shadow cast by the 1898 Treaty of Paris regime over the Filipinos' quest for self-determination. The profound influence of the DOP regime on this national imaginary may be seen, examined, and taught through two foundational cases, the 1928 Las Palmas arbitration between the United States of America and the Netherlands and the 2016 South China Sea arbitration between the Philippines and China under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. Now, between these two cases in which Philippine territory was adjudicated on, 88 years have intervened, yet they are interrelated in many ways 
and play a central role in the internationalization of Philippine borders. Through them, we can trace two diverging post-colonial projects. The first, an inward-looking exceptionalist view shaped by both the Spanish and Philippine colonial experiences. And the second, a pragmatic and outward-looking embrace of a modernist, multilateral cosmopolitanism driven by contemporary realities. Today, the 2016 SCS Arbitral Award is often touted as a tidy account of the triumph of international law over power, indeed of the Philippines' growth and turn, yet it actually undercuts an older nationalist narrative based paradoxically on the colonial legacy of the TOP regime and its associated treaties constituting the so-called rectangular international treaty limits. By virtue of the TOP regime, the U.S. would subsequently seek the inclusion of Miangas or Las Palmas to the possessions it had acquired from Spain. The island is located just some 50 miles off Mindanao, the southernmost of the Philippines' four biggest islands, and well within the international treaty limits. The lone arbitrator, the Swiss lawyer Max Huber, held that Spain had indeed derived original title from discovery of the Philippine Islands and validly ceded it to the United States through the 1898 Treaty of Paris. But he ruled for the Netherlands on the basis of effective occupation and intertemporal law. Huber rejected the theory propounded by the Americans of, of constructive possession through contiguity. On hindsight, contiguity may have very well been founded on the idea of an archipelagic unity of islands and the waters around them. Nevertheless, the lessons of Las Palmas would not be lost on Filipino leaders of the colony. Subsequent legislation in the American-led Commonwealth government sought to fortify the boundaries of the TOP regime. In the 1935 Constitutional Convention, held under American tutelage, Filipino constitutionalists made sure to write into the Constitution the precise longitudes and latitudes of the international treaty limits as integral to national territory. According to Delegate Vicente Singson Encarnacion, the National Territory Provisions principal sponsor, this was necessary because the Americans cannot be trusted to honor the word, as the world then only recognized an international founded on La Fuerza, Los Camiones. Thus, a document reeking of the worst vestiges of colonialism was deployed by colonial subjects to hold an imperial power in check. In the mid-1950s, the international treaty limits would be re-articulated in key diplomatic notes sent to the United Nations by the Philippines, now a newly independent state, in anticipation of the first Law of the Sea Conference. The Filipino legal advisor who drafted the diplomatic notes did so expressly on the basis of John Selden's Mary Clausum, while echoing the Las Palmas Arbitration's doctrine of effective occupation. This national territorial imaginary continued to be reflected in the 1973 and 1987 Philippine constitutions in a series of national legislation designed to firm up the integrity of the national territory, as well as informal submissions of the Philippine delegation to the Law of the Sea conferences. Now of particular concern to the Philippines was the eventual shape taken by the proposed doctrine of, doctrine of archipelagic states in the UNCLOS, which had rejected the Filipino integrative view of waters around its islands as internal waters subject only to the right of innocent passage. Or as Article 1 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution would put it in part, the waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago, regardless of their breadth and dimensions, form part of the internal waters of the Philippines. Thus, when the Philippines signed UNCLOS III on 10 October 1982, it made an official declaration essentially asserting the primacy of the international treaty limits over the relevant provisions of the law of the sea. Yet, post-colonial fishers would force Philippine authorities to reimagine history and its future. In the post marcus era, the Philippine Senate's 1991 decision to put out America's largest overseas military bases was followed by the steady rise of China as a new great power. As China developed a blue water navy at dizzying speed and began to more actively assert its expansive nine dash line claim over pretty much of the South China Sea, the Philippines struggled to modernize its armed forces, saddled as it was by manifold domestic problems. For a long time, it was thought that the only way to make the Philippines fully compliant with the law of the sea is to amend its constitution. However, in 2009, the Philippines passed a new UNCLOS compliant baselines law, Republic Act 9522, that formally declared the country an archipelagic state. 
in the 2011 case of Magaliona versus Executive Secretary, the Philippine Supreme Court dismissed the constitutional challenge against the new base tense law. However, it stopped short of ruling on the incompatibility between the law and the national territory provision of the 1987 constitution. It would take the UNCLOS tribunal in the 2016 SES arbitration award to expressly interpret that the Philippines had indeed abandoned the international treaty limits as a claim to historical title. It may be reasonably said that had the Philippines taken China to arbitral court on the basis of the TOP's international treaty limits, it would surely not have achieved the resounding victory on virtually all points it had raised before the UNCLOS tribunal. In fact, in 2014, the year it filed the arbitral case against China, the Philippines reached an agreement with Indonesia resolving their exclusive economic zone overlap in the Sulu Sulawesi region, with the former finally recognizing the loss of Miangas Island in the 1921 Las Palmas arbitration and the latter's use of the island to project its archipelagic baselines. At this point, it's tempting to say that the Philippines' turn from Saldanian Mare Closum to Grosjean Mare Libre signals its sovereign and independent willing away from the visages of an older international law where colonial conquest was a legal means of acquiring territory. Yet the weight of history continues to haunt the Philippines. post SES arbitration, the Philippines has also now found itself objecting to Malaysia's 12 December 2019 submission to the UN Commission on the limits of the continental shelf for its own extended continental shelf. Malaysia's submission implicitly draws from the 2016 SES Arbitral Award, ruling that all insular or maritime features of the Spratus Archipelago have no more than a 12 nautical mile territorial sea, being unable to generate their own exclusive economic zones and continental shelves. In doing so, Malaysia projected baselines from portions of Sabah known to Filipinos as North Borneo, and drew overlaps with waters claimed by the Philippines from maritime features of the Kalayaan Island group. Once again invoking the ghost of its colonial past, the Philippines asserted that the Republic of the Philippines has never relinquished its sovereignty over North Borneo. At the 1935 Philippine Constitutional Convention, Delegate Vicente Singson Encarnacion vigorously defended the need to specifically embody in the charter of a prospective independent nation state, the precise contours of the international treaty limits as security against imperialist designs. Yet in 1935, Delegate Incarnacion could not have foreseen the rise to power of Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte in 2016. Mr. Duterte's election to office on a populist platform less than two months before the UNCLOS Tribunal handed down the SES Arbitral Award only served to intensify the tension between history and Philippine national prerogatives. But Delegate Incarnacion might have very well anticipated China's imperial design to reshape not just the law of the sea, but international law itself, according to the force of imperial canons. Today, despite its long-standing national territorial imaginary, the Philippines has become an unlikely role model for other claimants in the South China Sea dealing with the Chinese civilizational state and its expansionism. It thus appears that the challenge of owning post-colonial history's hard lessons remains thus, being able to marshal with an agency all its own and without being cynical about it, available legal resources potentially and strategically to achieve national goals. So let me close with this question. Were he alive today, would Delegate Incarnacion be willing to transfer his nationalist faith from the TOP's international treaty limits to the law of the sea as a larger anti-imperialist document, warts and all. Thank you and good day. That was a very, very interesting presentation. And Ronald is here to answer questions after all the presentations uh, take place. Uh, I will turn to Joseph Duke Bagulaya, PhD candidate at the University of Hong Kong uh, Faculty of Law. Um, who will discuss reading international law through literature, which according to our speaker, transcends the limits imposed by time and law. What an interesting concept. Um, you may start your presentation. Jose, my friend, you're on mute. Hello, hello everyone. 
The title of my paper is A Literary Approach to the Teaching of International Law, The State of Exception and the Possibility of a Radical Right in Ruth Vermezes Guerra. In my short talk, I adopt the premise that the Philippines is under a permanent and undeclared state of exception, with thousands of drug suspects killed, hundreds of leftists murdered or imprisoned, rights appear to have been suspended, and martial law practices have become part of ordinary life, that they no longer appear exceptional. Based on this premise, I raise the following questions. How does one teach international law in a global South context where there is a permanent and undeclared state of exception? Is there any pedagogical approach to international law that would allow students in such context to reflect on their own social conditions and the relevance of international law to their society? My answer to these questions, of course, is to think about international law through literary works, particularly the novel form. Law is often abstract while literature is concrete. Law is often conceptual while literature is experiential. Thus literature allows students to think about international law in a specific context, provides them with a particular experience. For instance, Ruth Vermeza's Guerra or War tells of the non-international conflict between the Communist Party of the Philippines and the Philippine government during the 1970s the martial law period in Philippine history, written by an insurgent who operated in Cagayan province in the north of the major island of Luzon. This novel, I argue, represents a state of exception and the possibility of recovering the radical right of constituent power. The state of exception for Carl Schmitt is an exceptional situation where the executive arrogates into itself the powers of the legislature and the judiciary. It is exceptional that Schmitt would even think that it allows a dictator to suspend the constitution. No article in the constitution would be an insurmountable obstacle to the actions of the executive. The narrative of guerra, war, represents the state of exception through its reconstruction of the martial law period. It covers the declaration of martial law, which seems to have suspended both time and law. Time because the exception lasted so long, technically from 1972 to 1981. But in fact, it only ended in 1986, the year the dictatorship crumbled. The martial law power became an ordinary administrative technique, like a monetary and fiscal policy. It became what Georgia Agamben has called the fictive form of the exception. Moreover, it also suspended law in the sense that violence is inflicted on human bodies in violation of international humanitarian law and human rights. Many students today have no experience of this period, and for them, Violations of international regimes would simply be obstructions. I argue that guerra would allow them, number one, to experience the era. Number two, it would enable them to reflect on the concept of the state of exception and violations of international law under the exception. Number three, it would also allow them to reflect on the form of suspension of rights in their own time and society. For instance, the novel describes numerous acts that are violations of IHL and HR. Civilians and persons who are the combat are killed and beheaded and sometimes burnt, and their heads and bodies transformed into macabre spectacles in town plazas in violation of common article three of the Geneva Conventions. In fact, one of the most touching scenes in the novel is a part where villagers claim the bodies of their fellow villagers. The soldier simply gives them three heads and their bodies. Let me read to you a short excerpt. The heads are all in that sack. If you know these fellows, you could try fitting the heads to the bodies. A soldier brought a sack and laid the contents beside the headless corpses, a strong odor of blood and the Kai Ying's breast was raging. He took one of the head in his two hands and lay it beside a body. This is the head and body of Dani Salvatier. Another head was slowly taken and laid near a body, so bruised by dragging. This is the head and body of Leon Javier. In this excerpt, the victims all suffered ill treatment, disrespect for their dignity and unnecessary suffering. 
they were all dehumanized. It rests on Lakaying Ying to make them human again by fitting their heads to their bodies, by naming them, by affirming the connection of their corpses to a community of living bodies. Other incidents in the novel include the seizure, torture, and disposal of suspected rebels in rivers where decomposing bodies are partly eaten by fish. Then they are salvage, a practice ironically called salvage. The novel thus presents very concrete cases of violations of human dignity in the context of civil war. Through these concrete cases, one may see how an absolute vacuum of international norms would affect human bodies. IHL and HR are regimes that govern how human bodies should be treated, fundamental guarantees of human treatment, uh, of humane treatment, respect for dignity, prohibition of ill treatment, all regulate how human bodies should be treated. The same can be said about the human rights regime. Of course, Gera, the novel, goes beyond the present human rights regime, and this is its major accomplishment. The novel allows us to reflect on the possibility of recovering the most radical right, constituent power. Costas Duzinas and his student I. R. Wall have lamented the fact that international human rights have defined rights. Constituent power is no longer a right, only traces of it could be seen. Guerra allows us to reflect on the possibility of recovering this radical right. In the novel, characters think of their so-called democratic rights. These rights are non-juridical because they are not sanctioned by positive law under martial law and are often exercised in violation of existing state law. For instance, protest marches under martial law. In the novel, prohibitions on protests are defied. People ultimately gain courage in exercising their right. It is only fitting here to point out that the dictatorship collapsed by exercising a right of protest in the streets that eventually amounted to the exercise of constituent power. Indeed, this is recognized by the Philippine Supreme Court itself. Another example is what I call sovereign vengeance, which is the rebel act of striking back at violators of human rights at the request of the victims. This act is nothing but the exercise of the people's non-juridical right to rebel form of extracting justice when state institutions fail. Both democratic rights and sovereign vengeance form part of constituent power, which is a non-juridical right of peoples. This non-juridical right cannot be invoked by states and international courts. Nonetheless, my reading of the novel is that by dissolving juridical rights under states of the state of exception, such condition allows people to recover the non-juridical right of constituent power, which is a power to create and establish a new world. As such, the novel offers a critique of the limitations of the human rights regime, which relies so much on states, which more often than not are the primary violators of human rights. Thus, through the novel Guerra, students may be able to experience a state of exception, think of international law, particularly the application of humanitarian rules to internal conflict and the possibility of a radical notion of human rights. In other words, students have been introduced to doctrinal notions of rights for those who are still studying international regimes may be able not only to apply existing rules, but also to imagine something beyond the current international regimes. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. That was extremely interesting. I have so many questions for you at the end. And as I say that, I was gently reminded to tell the audience that please send your questions in and we will address them at the end uh, after all the presentations are done. You can use the Q&A uh, button at the under your speaker's videos. Um, I will now turn to Alice Ney Didugalana, which is Professor of Law and Dean of Mindanao State University. Uh, who will be discussing the creation of the Philippine Competition Act of 2015 uh, with, I guess, a critical eye um, in the context of the Philippines' uh, colonial experience. Good evening from Mindanao and good morning and good afternoon um, to, to everyone. My presentation is Critically Modern Philippine Competition Law Teaching International Legal History. As a response to treaty commitments towards ASEAN economic integration, the Philippines enacted a modernized Philippine Competition Act in 2015. The statutory text of the new law will readily show a fusion of American and European Union competition law systems. The congressional history of the crafting of the law likewise discloses a revealing fact 
the lawmakers were simply copying or doing a cut and paste of the United States and European Union competition laws. This is a new but complex brand of competition law model. While the idea of fusion of two competition law systems is novel in Philippine in competition law design, mixing laws from two legal traditions is not new to the Philippines. The Philippine legal system is a, new, is a union of common law and civil law legal traditions. The evolution of Philippine competition law began with the Código Penal of 1887 under the Spanish colonial periods. It, went, it underwent several stages of transformation. Against this background, in this short presentation, I will endeavor to answer the following questions. What happened to the Philippines' colonially implanted competition statutes after obtaining independence or, do, or during the post-colonial time? How do we teach competition law in the Philippines? Before I answer this question, let me briefly walk you through the Philippines' historical development of competition law. The Spanish occupation planted the first seed of competition law in 1884 by enforcing the Spanish Penal Code of 1870 to the Philippine Islands. On account of this historical evidence, the Philippines perhaps holds the record of having the earliest competition law in developing world and undisputedly the first to have in the whole of Asia. This is a noticeable gap in the earlier studies which pointed to other jurisdictions. The Penal Code contains three relevant provisions to deal with acts in restraint of trade. These are Article 542, 543, and 544 of the old Penal Code. Fast forward, Spain and the United States signed the Treaty of Paris on December 10, 1898, the treaty concluding the Spanish-American War. This treaty granted independence to Cuba but made the Philippines American position. After taking over the Philippine Islands, the American colonial rule maintained the Spanish imposed civil law, including Spanish copied penal law. But when the second Philippine Commission was set up in 1900, which possessed legislative and executive functions, common law doctrines and American laws began to stimulate the civil law legal systems of the Philippine Islands. And with the American dominated Supreme Court at its apex, and the almost indiscriminate importing of American statute as modern law, it became inescapable for the court to interpret laws according to American case laws. On December 1, 1925, the Philippine legislature enacted Act Number 30 to 47, entitled An Act to Prohibit Monopolies and Combinations in the Strain of Trade. This act supplemented the three competition related provisions of the old penal code. Act Number 30 to 47 is virtually the Sherman Act. This was followed by adopting the Clayton, by adopting the Clayton Act in 1929 and subsequently several antitrust cases that found their way in Philippine jurisprudence and even up to the present. Since the establishment of the American sovereignty in the islands, public opinion had been clamoring for the old penal code amendment. And December 8, 1930, the Philippine legislature approved the revised penal code. Uh, the, the revised penal code, although primarily based on the penal code, did not retain the entire three articles. It reinvented Act 3247 under Article 186, which still resembles the statutory text of the Sherman Act. Finally, Article 186 of the revised penal code was adopted in the 1973 and 1987 Philippine constitutions, marking the beginning of the Philippine competition laws constitutionalization. Let me go back to the early question, what happened to the Philippines colonial implanted competition statute after obtaining independence? Nothing happened. There was simply a lack of enforcement. Philippine studies attributed the lack of enforcement to one, many regulators, regulatory capture, lack of comprehensive competition law, and the lack of jurisprudence on competition law. The recommendation was to pass a new law because the old regime was outdated and inadequate. While there is basis for the four main reasons. The studies ignored one fundamental point, the historical evolution of the Philippine competition law system. This brings us to the theoretical debate on the transferability of law. From a legal transplant theory, the embryonic Philippine common law largely contributed to the stagnant enforcement of Article 186 as the Philippines' principal competition law statute. While it is true that Spanish-derived court system eventually had the image of a US court system, Filipino judges do not function like a common law judges. The next question is, why is teaching competition law from international legal history important 
in the Philippines context. As you already know, before the enactment of the Philippine Competition Act in 2015, the Philippine competition regime was solely influenced by U.S. antitrust regime. But the new law is now a marriage of EU and U.S. competition law concepts. While the two regimes from functional comparative law are pursuing the same goal, that is economic efficiency, the differences are difficult to ignore. And if this will not be managed, it might compromise the predictability and fairness of the law. It will merely lead to attention. It will lead to attention of norms within the law. Thus, in this context, teaching it from legal history and international law paradigms becomes indispensable both from the enforcement and advocacy point of view. This model of law is already part of Philippine constitutionalism. It's higher norm of law. Many U.S. cases interpreting antitrust norms have already been transplanted in Philippine jurisprudence. Therefore, teaching the new law from a legal history, tracing its colonial roots and its transformation will give it the prerequisite context. It will allow the law to undergo the process of localization. This will address the void and gaps in the knowledge of Philippine competition law for not having been offered as a subject in Philippine law schools. This explains why competition law is virtually unknown to many in the Philippine legal community, including lawmakers. Let me proceed to the, to, the, to the elephant in the room. How should we teach competition law in the Philippines? Generally, there are two schools of thought in teaching competition law. One is teaching from a single jurisdiction perspective, teaching the law purely as a municipal law. The other paradigm is to teach the law from a global perspective. I subscribe to the latter view. There are normative and practical reasons why teaching competition law from an international paradigm is ideal. First and foremost, the widespread adoption of competition law was argued to be linked with the proliferation of trade treaties in the 1990s, such as creating free trade zones or for structural programs that intended to open up developing world economies and facilitate the entry of foreign entities. The exposure of the harmful effect of international cartel on developing countries had also convinced policymakers of the urgency of enacting competition laws. Building on the earlier empirical study, the two leading causes of the expeditious proliferation of competition law in developing countries are globalization resulting from downfall of the communism and worldwide deregulations and the conditionality of development aids and loans from international organizations like the World Bank. In fact, it was the ASEAN magic that finally gave life to the remodeled Philippine competition law, which is the longest running bill that has been pending in Philippine Congress since 1980s. In conclusion, as teaching competition law will be new in the Philippines, the gaps in the Philippine jurisprudence and in the legal scholarship in the academia pose a great challenge to anyone who will be teaching competition law. Thus, teaching the new law in isolation with its international roots as a colonial legacy will do more harm than good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth Ney. Very, very interesting uh, presentation as well. Um, thank you for the, to the attendees that are already sending in their comments and questions. Please carry on doing that um, for the presentations you have questions for. Um, I'm gonna turn to John Paolo Roberto A. Villasor of the University of Negros Occidental Recoletos School of Law. Um, who is discussing the uh, qualifications requirements for teaching law uh, in the Philippines and the potential of multidisciplinary teaching of international law. Over to John. John, I think your uh, mic is off. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Irene. Um, good morning from London. Um, good afternoon um, elsewhere in the world, and good evening from Bacolod City, Philippines. My name is J.P. Villasor, and um, my, my presentation for today is, is entitled The Institutional Academic Freedom and the LLM Requirement in Teaching International Law in the Philippines, a conspectus for Philippine legal education. The central thesis of this presentation revolves around the proposition that an advanced degree in law, specifically a master of laws degree, should be made a preference instead of a requirement for the teaching of law in the Philippines. 
for implementation by law schools in the exercise of academic freedom. Beyond this proposition, the presentation aims to discuss the need for a fundamental rethinking of the teaching of international law in these turbulent times. How, how is academic freedom of law schools um, defined in the Philippines? In various jurisprudence, institutional academic freedom has been defined as the freedom of a college or university to pursue its mission and to be free from governmental control. It is a principle derived from the notion of freedom of thought. It is the freedom to teach, freedom to learn. Principles that are central to the proper functioning and purpose of higher education. All institutions of higher learning in the Philippines are guaranteed academic freedom under the Philippine constitution. It was Justice Felix Frankfurter in the US Supreme Court case in of Sweezy versus New Hampshire who further um, uh, explained the four freedoms that are contained in academic freedom. According to Justice Frankfurter, academic freedom, the independence of an academic institution to determine for itself who may teach, what may be taught, how it shall be taught, and who may be admitted to study. In a recent case in the Supreme Court, um, we affirm the academic freedom of law schools. This case uh, is entitled Pimentel versus Legal Education Board. One of the issues resolved by the High Court, which is the subject of inquiry in this presentation, is whether the Legal Education Board possesses the power to impose qualifications for law faculty members. This case emanated from the conflict or brought about by the diametrically opposed approaches the Legal Education Board and the law schools. While the Legal Education Board adopted a legal positivist approach in regulating law schools, the law schools, on the other hand, adopted a legal realist approach in administering their respective law schools. This case was brought to the court sometime in 2017 and was decided on September 10th, 2019. High Court held that the act and practice of the Legal Education Board of dictating the qualifications and classification of faculty members, the deans of schools of law, and the deans of graduate schools of law is unconstitutional for being ultra virus and in violation of the principle of institutional academic freedom, specifically on the issue of who may teach in law schools. So it deals directly with the qualifications of faculty members to teach in law schools. So my question now is how do we operationalize Pimentel versus Legal Education Board to affirm the constitutionally guaranteed protection on academic freedom in the teaching of international law. We must rethink the teaching of international law in post-pandemic Philippine state of exception. Amidst one of the longest lockdowns in the world, there has been a trade-off in the Philippines and in other parts of the world with regard to civil liberties due to the global public health emergency. Civil liberties, including respect for due process, freedom of expression, freedom to travel, and the right to privacy, foundational values that the state commits to uphold, have taken a back seat at this moment in time. Due to the exigent conditions brought about by the coronavirus pandemic, Many are willing to voluntarily surrender some of their fundamental freedoms to ensure the protection of their remaining rights and liberties. And one such right is the right to health. This places the teaching and practice of international law at the crossroads. My next question is, so where do we go from here? Beyond the freedom to determine who may teach at law schools, 
reforms in legal education are needed to address the more significant freedoms on what to teach in international law and how international law may be taught in institutions of higher learning in the Philippines. In this regard, we must strengthen the pedagogical foundations of legal education by taking into account realities facing the world at present. So how do we achieve this? First, we must teach international law and by taking into account post-pandemic realities and circumstances. The study, teaching, and practice of international law may contribute to resolving the global health crisis through international cooperation and international standard setting of norms to safeguard global public health. As the aims of, of law should be justice and the common good, the aims of the university, especially their component schools of law, should be the search for, for truth and freedom of thought. Second, we must develop an interdisciplinary approach to arrive at the best possible solution to international legal problems, taking into account cross jurisdictions. The way forward would be to provide law schools the flexibility of determining the qualifications of law faculty members in the exercise of their academic freedom. An interdisciplinary approach would allow law schools the academic freedom to hire law faculty who are recognized experts in their respective fields. For example, the experts in law and economics may have PhDs in economics instead of a PhD or, uh, in law or, or a master of laws. Uh, a, a concrete example here is the University of Chicago Law School which has, which, which uh, had during his lifetime, uh, Dr. Ronald, Professor Ronald Coase as, uh, as one of their faculty, the eminent Professor Coase, who happens to be the father of the law and economics school. He is not a, a lawyer, but he is an economist, but he is the best person to have taught uh, the law and economics program being the father of the program. Another concrete example here is an expert in policies in the policy science school. An expert in the policy science school would normally have a PhD in, in public policy or in decision sciences instead of a JSD or even a PhD in, in law. Um, an, an example of, of this uh, is in Yale Law School. Well, with, with uh, um, with uh, a collaboration between uh, the law school and their department of political science. Furthermore, an interdisciplinary approach would also promote a more expansive debate on the finer points of law as it relates to say international relations or uh, more expansively international history. An interdisciplinary approach would be more inclusive of emerging fields of inquiry, which may include law and computer science or law, information, technology, and society to explore the greater questions of culture and ethics in the use of modern technology. It is vital that we, we adapt legal pedagogy that reflects the global nature of today's legal reality by rejecting the traditional focus on an autonomous national system. Cross-cultural perspectives may be sought and interdisciplinary frameworks of analysis may be applied to specific legal problems. To further illustrate this point, the framework to be utilized in analyzing complex issues in the current pandemic may be better served if an integrated law, science, and health policy, public health policy approach is adopted. Third, in the analysis of international legal problems, inclusivity in approach would allow broader perspectives in analysis. The law should be crafted to promote inclusivity rather than exclusivity. And, and uh, uh, we must need to incorporate all these, these other perspectives in order to make the law more dynamic and more, more vibrant. 
legal education must confront the realities, likewise, of multi-jurisdictional practice, sometimes described as the internationalization of law and legal practice. Greater access in today's uh, reality are, are, are apparent for lawyers and legal services across borders. Fourth, we must be able to design integrative pedagogy that would require law faculty to be both knowledge, knowledgeable in several disciplines aside from the law. This would include computer skills that would allow them to teach and engage law students online. We must be able in this sense to harness the power of technology to bridge the gap created by limited person-to-person -person classes and address the needs of legal education during a global pandemic. The reality of intermittent lockdowns and limitations on the right to travel have brought about the necessity of harnessing the power of technology to address the needs of legal education during a global pandemic, especially the need for greater internet uh, connectivity. Uh, finally, may I just, um, before, before I end my presentation, may I just quote um, the words of Hannah Arendt uh, in her essay, The Crisis of Education. Education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it and by the same token, save it from that ruin which, except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and young, would be inevitable. Education must be used to prepare the next generation for the task of renewing a common world. That ends my presentation, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, as I said, some questions are already coming in. As I said, please uh, to send us your questions. Um, as we go to the next speaker, uh, Rodel A. Teton of the Graduate School of Law of San Sebastian College Recoletas, um, who will discuss the future of graduate education in the Philippines. Over to you, Rodel. Thank you very much, Irene. Hello everyone, good evening from the Philippines and to my colleagues, congratulations. The title of my presentation is Between Pragmatism and Potential, Lessons on Teaching International Law in the Philippines through the San Sebastian College Recoletos Manila LLM Program Consortium. International law is a compellingly elegant subject. This discussion looks into teaching international law both as a paradigm and a pedagogical framework in the Philippine legal education. As a paradigm, it is so influenced by the approaches in other jurisdictions. Teaching international law is viewed as huge and only for the chosen few in the Philippines. It faces a negative attitude among peers. However, this work asserts that when integrated with other subjects, international law becomes a good content that is relatable to many. As a pedagogical framework, it is interesting to see how this transcends to students and their use of their personal learnings in their own teaching approaches. Lessons first will show that this paradigm and framework can be building blocks in establishing a model for learning in the Philippines, across Asia and the world. I'd like to start by bringing you to Manila, the Philippines where the subject of this discussion emanates. It leads us to the premise that legal education in the Philippines, whether we admit it or not, is still Manila-centric. With the requisite for teachers of the law to acquire master of laws, as enunciated by J.P. Villasor earlier, provincial law schools are left with no choice but to comply. A problem exists, however, and they cannot just easily fly to Manila and leave their family, work, and community. Thus, the consortium to offer LLM program outside of Metro Manila. Today, in the span of just three years, which includes a pandemic time, 
SSCR was able to perfect consortium with six independent law schools in the Philippines, the Tarlac State University, University of Cebu, University of San Jose Recoletos, University of Negros Occidental Recoletos, San Sebastian Extension, and St. Columban College, spread over the three major islands of Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, recognizing the diversity of culture, ethno-linguistic features, and all united to teach and study law. And this is where the experiential reflections commence. The key issues in this discussion in the international law teaching in an LLM program with comparative and international law tracks has yielded the following responses. First, it is effective in terms of improvement of pedagogy and strengthening professional competency. It does say that legal education in the Philippines can cope with the trends in international legal education. Now, it is established that the consortium is a collaboratively defined partnership for legal education. Using our model, it breaks the barriers as democratization of legal education is an achievement unlocked. The basic mechanics of our consortium is that we handle the academic requisites and the partner provides a venue and helps cater to the demands in the local setting. We fly to the venue, of course, that is before the pandemic, to conduct classes in a weekend until the pandemic came where we are hindered by travel restrictions. But today, online is the name of the term and we can do that. The interest in public international law is stirred because of the courses being offered in the Graduate School of Law. From their basic six units of required subjects and electives in law school, this time they are required to take more international law subjects. And our students are mostly teachers of the law, but not all take international law as part, as a path in teaching or even in practice. No international law related cases are exposed to local practitioners. Even if there is or there are, it is overridden by the domestic application, employing domestic law or regulations, let's say human rights. In response to the first issue raised in this work, in the actual experience, it was observed that the following have intensified the LLM classes where professors are mostly using the following methods. Brainstorming that provides intensive discussion and spontaneous suggestions as solutions to a problem are received uncritically. Dialogues where groups of students discuss issues for a short period during a class and make solutions for reforms or policy, reporting and class discussions, a learning situation where class direction are controlled by the individual students or group and the teacher observes and asks questions, large group dialogues, the topic and general direction are given by the group but the organization content and direction of the discussion depend on the student groups of, of number of, or so of students. They are happy with face-to-face -face classes, but are contented during the online pandemic classes. The methods and a combination thereof are commendable highlights in the conduct of this consortium. Students feel that the classes are not the mandatory continuing legal education as required here in the Philippines for lawyers, where purely lectures are done and merits international law for two hours of compliance. Students take advantage of the different approaches to learn and collaborate. Now, on the aspect of strengthening professional competency, this work reveals threat in international law significantly increased because of the integrated approaches being undertaken. The students claim that they are applying many of the lessons they learned from the classes to their own teaching processes. Does legal education in the Philippines then cope with the trends of international legal education? The answer is yes. Filipino scholars are competent and at par with others around the globe. The Philippines has no difficulty in English language or other languages, and so the access to materials, texts, and other forms of educational teaching is available. This has become pronounced even during this time of online classes, where digitization and online mechanisms of resources create virtual generosity and exchange of intellectual property. 
The efforts to include professors from outside the Philippines, from the US, Europe, Australia, or other areas are good initial steps and are components of the program. Currently also, we are like evaluating the entry of three foreign doctors of law from Europe and the US who are interested to join the program. Our, these are a very welcome development. And of course, many of you here are welcome to join us. As a conclusion, it is worth to note that the institutional proficiencies develop open the further democratization and professionalization of legal education in the provinces in the Philippines. The techniques in the content delivery, use of technology, and the overall pedagogy met the expectations. The shift from parochial to the world perspectives appropriate to the teachers, teachers of the law. Expected outcomes based on dialogues to larger group mechanics and practical exercises are executed to the benefit of the professional students. Thus, competency is heightened and it assures that international law promises a lot for Filipino scholars. The consortium strengthened the unity towards a modern, responsive, and effective legal education in the country. International linkages likewise generate a huge impact to bring in international law, a spectrum rooted in the sphere of the locales, opening bigger perspectives to the end users, as well as consistent with our vision to create global classrooms. We are open to consortium and collaborations from foreign universities to be with us in the Philippines. Again, you are welcome. And with the lessons learned from this consortium, the latter can be enhanced as a model for teaching international law and delivering graduate education in law, crisscrossing barriers, much of a potential that is global. And as always, we say, when you go to San Sebastian, look up and aspire. The only steel church in Asia welcomes you to the gates of SSER. Bravo, Baste. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodel. A really, really interesting um, presentation. Um, I will turn, I will open the floor now to Melissa Locha. Uh, consultant international law, international energy law, um, to give us your views. Uh, and I also want to address some questions to Melissa. Uh, Melissa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The task of this discussion is threefold. First, I print together the five papers to present the characterization of the context traditions and perspectives that influence the teaching of international law in the Philippines. Second, I try to situate the five papers within the context of the broader research question of the webinar, which is whether the teaching of international law transforms international law and whether international law in substance and remedial aspects transform the teaching of international law in the Philippines. And finally, I try to suggest some structural and stylistic changes in the papers in order for them to qualify as a research article rather than as mere reports. So let me begin with the paper on the consortium. The paper begins by addressing the question of how international law can be more attractive to students in the Philippines. At present, it is not as attractive as other courses of, of law, essentially because it is not a bar subject. So the paper proceeds to um, explain that a shift in regulation led to the conceptualization of the consortium of six, six law schools spread across three geographical and linguistic groupings in the Philippines, namely Mindanao, Luzon, and the Visayas. And then it raises a very important question. How does the consortium impact the teaching, the practice of teaching international law in the Philippines? And the paper produces preliminary data that indicate three very important points. First, there was an exponential increase in enrollment, even at the time of the pandemic, and the enrollees are not just enrollees in Manila, but also enrollees in the other parts of the country, including 
professors of other subjects of law, as well as judges, sitting judges in the courts. And this particular data would indicate a form of a trend towards democratization of access to knowledge and learning international law in the Philippines. In the past, knowledge of international law was a monopoly of the elite universities in Manila. Through the consortium, that monopoly is being broken down. The second set of data indicate that the enrollment of judges and professors of other subjects of or other fields of, of law in the consortium could lead to a form of cross-pollination of international law with constitutional law, with commercial law, with civil law, with criminal law, and thereby enriching knowledge of international law in the Philippines. And of course, improving the competence of not just professors of international law, but even of practitioners of other fields of law. And finally, the data indicate that there is a depth of diversity, culturally, linguistically, religiously, uh, ethnically, in the enrollees of the consortium. And this alone indicates that the, through the consortium, especially if it's linked up with other law schools in other parts of the globe, including through Bikil, for instance, that the consortium could lead to a global discourse of international law taking place finally in the Philippines. So let me move to the paper on the liter literary approach to international law. It addresses a very narrow, well-defined research question, in which is, how does one teach international human rights law and international humanitarian law in a society where there is a state of exception and to a generation of students that have, who have cocooned themselves in the false reality of social media? And the author here posits that this can be done through a literary approach to international law, using in particular the novel Guerra as instructional material. And he argues that number one, Guerra has a capacity to transport students from their state of apathy into a world of concrete violations ruthless violations of international human rights and international humanitarian law. The novel speaks to the person rather than to the abstract student of law. Second, Guerra contextualizes the story in history and therefore exposes the state of exception not as an, a timeless, as a timeless reality, but rather as a reality that has a beginning and therefore could have an end. And finally, Guerra employs symbolisms that enables the teacher to explain international human rights law and international humanitarian law in one scene of the story where soldiers order the villagers to mix and match the heads with the torsos of their victims. And with that particular scene, you have the entire universe of international human rights law and humanitarian law explained as a deprivation of dignity and a deprivation of identity. So as to the third paper on history and international law, the, the paper addresses the question of how can one teach international law using a critical legal approach in a society that has that is steep in positivist international law and a civil law jurisdiction at that. And the author narrows down the question to how the concept of territory can be taught. And the author does not use the 
concept of territory, but rather what he calls the Filipino national territorial imaginary. And therefore, he relates it as a struggle for identity rather than a struggle for boundaries or a struggle for fixed baselines. And he depicts this struggle in three progressions. In the first progression, of course, it is just in an imposition of an identity on a colony by Imperial US or colonial Spain. And this is formalized in the Treaty of Paris. But in the second progression, you have a country decolonizing itself and in the process claiming what was ceded by Spain to the United States as their territorial imaginary. And therefore you have Filipinos at the international stage, in particular the Convention on the Territorial Sea, making an assertion that our territorial waters include the waters, the vast waters enclosed by the treaty limits of the Treaty of Paris. And finally, the current progression where there is a dilemma between um, maintaining that historical imaginary of the Philippine territory uh, based on the Treaty of Paris and conceding to the positivist tradition started by Bonclus and finally in the South China Sea arbitration, conceding that concept of territory with one that is bound by fixed baselines and boundaries in order for us to claim a vast sea for as our exclusive economic zone. And of course, we face that struggle even more during the South China Sea arbitration where the Philippines had to recognize that in order to challenge China's claim based on historic title, the Philippines also must concede that it has no historic title to the waters bound by the Treaty of Paris limits. And we move on to the fourth paper on academic freedom. The, this paper situates the question of whether international law is a purely positivist tradition or if it is it derives from social forces, from social processes, and brings that question onto the stage of two regulatory forces. Here you have the Philippine state seeking to regulate competence and competitiveness in the teaching of international law by imposing that teachers of international law must have a postgraduate degree in law. And vis-a-vis -vis the institutions such as the law schools uh, asserting academic freedom to choose those who can teach international law and to say that if we adopt a non-positivist approach to international law, for instance, if we adopt the social policy approach to international law, or maybe the cultural, the gender approach, or the critical legal studies approach, then we, in the name of academic freedom, can choose to allow teachers, to allow a person to teach international law, even if that person does not have a law background, even if that person has a background in anthropology, in sociology, in development policies, in even in public health. And th that debate is contextualized or even made more apparent in the present context of the COVID-19, where universities realize that the teaching of international law needs to be multidisciplinary and that it needs to be multi-jurisdictional. And finally, we come to the final paper on competition law. This paper asks the very simple question of how can competition law be taught as a municipal law if in fact it was motivated by one original instrument in particular the ASEAN economic community and two, the substance of that law was borrowed 
from US and UK jurisdictions. And finally, that law originated from a colonial civil law system, Spain, as well as, as a colonial or imperial common law system, the US. And therefore the author here argues that far from being a mere municipal law, competition law will have to be taught with some elements or influences of international law as well as comparative law. So overall, the five papers present a collage, a picture collage rather than an entire picture of the practice of, interna of teaching international law in the Philippines. It is a picture collage of the context, perspectives, and traditions that continue to influence in the teaching in the Philippines. And best of all, it the, the papers demonstrate that teaching in the Philippines is no, no longer static. There are developments taking place at the institutional level, such as through the consortium, at the instructive level, such as through history and competition law as a comparative law instrument, as well as the level of instruction in the form of, in, in terms of the approach, meaning the literary approach to international law or the sociological and non-positivist approach to international law as advocated by those who seek academic freedom in, in their institutions. The, the, the five papers certainly do not provide the final picture of teaching international law in the Philippines, but they do offer a glimpse of what can be possible in terms of the practice of teaching international law in the Philippines and how it, this tradition or this practice can influence in substance international law as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for your input. Uh, very interesting how you brought everything together for us. And I want to address one of the questions from the attendees to you, uh, from Alcena Jeffers. Um, the question is, what is the bigger question for the Philippines people themselves? Um, it needs real peacemakers to solve some of these issues that were discussed today. And I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts about that, with Melissa? Sorry, your microphone is off. Sorry, could you could you say the question again? Is it is it written? Yes. Uh, right. The question is, what is the bigger question for the Philippines people themselves? I think it's a question about the overall kind of presentations today. Uh, it needs real peacemakers to solve some of these issues. Um. Is is this a discussion about the international human humanitarian law? Or is this, is this just a broad question? I think it's a broader question about how, what the issues we discussed today and some of the issues that you have raised as well. Uh, for example, uh, there is a question as well on dignity and what is dignity? Um, but we can mm -hmm. come to that question in a bit. All right. Well, from, a, from the perspective of a person who teaches international law, for instance, or a researcher of international law, the bigger problem in the Philippines has to do with the fact that we have no understanding of international law. For a long time, international law was a, an, a, a the knowledge of a very, very, very small elite group in Manila. That elite group can dictate what international law means for the rest of the, of the, of the country. So that is one not having any knowledge of international law among our people, for instance, or even among students of law, means that we have no understanding of the, of the expanse of our rights and the basis of our power to challenge government. We also have a situation where there is some form of um, short memory about our experience with martial law. And therefore you have a generation that has become detached from 
our past. And there's need for us to reconnect them to our past in order for them to understand that what is happening is well inherited from our martial law history. In terms of dignity, the Pope Guerra identifies in one passage, depicts the problem of deprivation of dignity by depicting a villager, I mean villagers being forced to reconnect the head, a, a decapitated head with any of the torsos that they find. And in reconnecting one head with one torso does not make the person, that person, the, the person that you know, because the, the dignity of that person is the one that clothes that human body with the individuality and the human beingness, which is entitled to rights. So that particular passage, I would say, teaches international human rights and humanitarian law all at the same time in just one short passage. I hope that answers your question. This Yes, definitely. Yes, a very interesting answer. Um, I want to turn to Ellen Albrecht, who very kindly offered to give us some European perspectives and make some comments about today's presentations. And thank you for joining us on such short notice. We definitely jumped on the opportunity to draw some parallels and comparisons live. Uh, so welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say my internet is not 100% stable. I hope it will go through. Yeah, so apologies for any disruptions. And uh, I have to say I'm really very, very touched to hear these talks. And I feel the fascinating uh, matter is how much we have in common, actually. Yeah, and that it's not the Philippines with a colonial past looking for something, but actually the search for teaching the law for international the new approach to international law matters to all of us. And I have to say, my own background, as you can hear, I'm from Germany, and we have moved to the UK in 2006. And I was working in culture, and I was very surprised. Uh, I, I did then a conversion and studied law, and uh, did a master in uh, with international energy law and international law. I was very surprised to learn about my own past here from a UK perspective, because I was surprised. So you, you have to imagine, in, in Germany, we have been occupied with our Nazi past and trauma for 40 years or 50 years. And to see my own country from a UK perspective and from Anglo-American territory was quite interesting and many of the subjects that you are uh, referring to occurred in my own mind and were, were essential so for example uh, i really like this approach of freely debating and freely discussing things brainstorming letting everything out this matters mattered a lot for us here in the uk because the uk were gathering many people from other jurisdictions yeah from greece from france from spain and we had the same opportunity to kind of evolve our thoughts and our perspectives in british law courses with teachers who would allow for these kind of open discussions so we also have this kind of processing of our past because as we know we uh, the, the european war and history has changed international law and we have most of our international law facilities are built upon the experience of the second world war so just just to, to give you a background and i fully um uh, appreciate your uh, kind of referring to novels which at some stages popped up of course here in um, i think in the uk and, and during my law course uh, competition law was of utmost concern and i found we are really struggling this was far uh, many many years before brexit that you could feel the tensions between different approaches to competition law and there were ongoing tensions between european thoughts about competition law and the American version about competition law. And what really helped me, I came from a very family background. I came from Europe and I was in constant fear from my children, how the food is going, kind of the degradation of environmental resources, uh, meat consumption, very uh, bad quality of our food, getting worse and worse. And I was really interested in finding solutions in the law. So it was actually a matter of international trade law, international environmental law, and so on. So what really helped me from European concept was this book by um, 
David Gigerba. I think he's of uh, German background, moved to the UK, and I don't know if everyone knows it, but it really gave me an account and would explain the divide between the German-Austrian approach to competition law and the Anglo-American approach to competition law, which essentially is a positive approach versus a principled approach. And we are now in the process between both jurisdictions to find together, and I think the solutions need to be found, and we, we, are, we can't submit. So all the subjects and topics that you have discussed will matter in two hour discussions as well. For example, taking the experiences from social, legal experiences, social affairs in domestic spheres, and the international law impact on these issues. This is a back and forward, so one belongs to the other. I found this quite interesting. Then, um, yeah, so competition law, I, I think this historic approaches can't be good enough. I ended up with the idea always, uh, and I think many do, to question the whole concept of competition law in the time of climate change and environmental problems, because it's it just, what does it suggest? That we, we are always kind of bad in our economic activities, that we always need to have some sanctions and some sanctionary systems to kind of re restrict our uh, abuse of power and all these things. And I was wondering, we, we possibly need to find to far, identify far better economic ways to deal with each other. And in the end, it will all ho hopefully move into a cooperation law and not a competition law. Because I, I personally, from a human perspective, very much question this necessity for competition at all. In many realms of our human life, we don't compete with each other, we cooperate. Competition is fun, it's play, it's necessary to strengthen ourselves. But in the end, we need to make sure that everyone has got their space and can kind of make their living. That's one issue. And the second thing which I discovered in my husband has actually uh, enforced this, this was um, Upton Sinclair. And it's not only this book, Oil, which explain the oil markets in uh, and uh, jungle is quite fascinating it refers to the meat factories in chicago in the 20s and it's it's always the same problem yeah this kind of uh, building business building it up creating big markets creating capital resuming many of migrant workers to to run the whole thing and then and this i, I found this quite interesting because what is not exactly clear. So in Germany, we, we were really looking at the history before uh, Hitler came into power and before the Third Reich or during the Third Reich in the development towards Hitler. And actually, we had the same problem. Yeah, we were very successful in running big, big factories, big chemical works, um, works would create lots of opportunities for the banking sector, financial services, the financial instruments would kind of get bigger and bigger and more sophisticated and more sophisticated, in, in the end it collapsed. And you had definitely this point where German Germany and the huge population were one and the same for, for the 19th century. We were, had fantastic relations with the Holocaust. But just to make, to, to make clear, the factories were run by everyone. And at some point it was just collapsing. And so I think this history it's very, very important to always have this historic development in mind and possibly to go for a radical development towards a global approach because it's so much information that we have and that we need to take on board. But we are very much under pressure in terms of practical approaches. So in this sense, I think so my, my current stand and I have been out of law for what things we do. And then kind of take it from there and see what what are always the positive and constructive approaches. That's all I find in this way. So I, yeah, just to conclude, this success, um, the final resource. I'm not sure how far this is advanced, but what also I found very interesting uh, from my perspective here as European was the inter um, the approach by um, Antonio. Ah, I've forgotten. I hope I it's a book. It's the International Law for Humankind, a book by a Brazilian lawyer called Antonio Cansada. And he refers to the history of international lawmaking. And I find it's a fantastic account. But what it also uh, states is that we have con uh, we need to develop more our mental and conscious 
capacities and capabilities. And I think that's something in law, it's always very dangerous that you have black letter law. And once the law is, <laughs> is there, you take it for granted. It's for what, what is the historical context? And he opens the way to, to take this as kind of a human approach. And I think this is also very topical and it will evolve by time. So by all top, just my account very broad. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Len. Thank you. Um, Barry, um, I know you have some questions for our speakers. Yes, uh, I thought I'd jump in with a few thoughts. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for your fantastic uh, presentations, really rich uh, array of, of thoughts there. Um, just a few thoughts, really. Um, I think that uh, obviously one of the themes that came out of the presentations was uh, the value of interdisciplinarity. And listening to a number of the presentations, I think one of the themes which came out in a lot was this importance of looking to history, looking to colonialism, looking to how history continues to the present day, you know, post-colonial themes as well, um, how you know, uh, colonial structures continue to the present day, um, but also looking to the past and looking at historical narratives. Uh, and so one question I have uh, really to anyone is really, um, how central you see history to your, your areas of study in, in teaching uh, international law, because it strikes me as something that you can't really grapple uh, with international law without grappling with its history. Um, and that really leads on to the other point, which is you know, historians, uh, if we're talking about including other disciplines uh, in, in teaching, historians would seem to be a, a pretty good candidate uh, related to that. Uh, the second, uh, thought or question uh, relates to uh, sort of, uh, I think, Roddell's uh, presentation at uh, the beginning where you described international law as seen, you know, as this kind of exceptional thing for the few, um, this kind of sacred uh, space, which, which um, and this is actually a theme which, which, which has come up in, in a number of other webinars, this idea that uh, international law is seen as this kind of exceptional space and also that that, you know, for some students uh, in, in different countries around the world, it's actually seen as quite irrelevant. They, they, they can't really grasp its relevance to, to their lives. And I just wondered uh, whether that was something that was uh, reflected in, in the Philippines as well, whether there is that sort of uh, perspective or whether it's different um, and why. Um, and then finally, um, uh, Jose's uh, presentation, which I, I really enjoyed um, about, you know, uh, this kind of law and literature approach uh, I just wondered also uh, how much uh, you'd, you'd use that in the classroom and more generally, because it strikes me as also something that's um, sort of an area that could be delved into more as a, as a technique for teaching, really delving into literature to see what it can bring uh, in terms of insights to the international uh, legal field. Thank you. Um, uh, so any, anyone, anyone can respond uh, as they well, wish. Well, uh, I'll just maybe respond to the question. I think that's really, for me, it's very central. Uh, well, to begin with, uh, Melissa already said that we are people who, have been, who seem to have no memory. Um, martial law it seems like, you know, 100 years away uh, ago for many of us. We have cases in, in Supreme Court on the, the burial of uh, the, 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 the remains of the dictator because and the Supreme Court basically uh, rewrote history, the, the history of uh, martial law by saying that, yes, we can allow his uh, remains to be buried in the National Heroes Cemetery. Um, in, in my class, I always tell my students that uh, we don't need to look far. There's so many archives in Europe uh, of materials in the Philippines from the Philippines that were spread away. Somebody has to read uh, uh, those archives and, and write legal history and right international perspective. Because right now, most scholarship uh, is written from outside about the Philippines. Uh, and we've lost the facility in Spanish. Well, to begin with, Spanish was not really taught to the Filipinos. It was only the elite who spoke Spanish. Uh, but you can just begin to, to imagine how much uh, material is being written, not by legal scholars, but by historians. Uh, there's very few legal, uh, legal scholars who write about legal history on that score. So I, I think that history would really be central to the teaching of international law. And as a second point, I think that uh, for me personally, as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone teaches international, I, I always tell my students that in order to understand this international, we must 
accept it at the same time of posting. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, judge justices in the Supreme Court, uh, who has who was known for his dissents, would 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 uh, would characterize international in theological terms. He would say, uh, the, "My colleagues in this court think think of international in terms of aseity. It's a theological concept of international being everywhere and anywhere." And he said, "I think we 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 give too much importance to international law." Uh, and what, what it really means is that uh, international is also always misunderstood and it's given too much credit for, for a lot of things that are not really there for the Philippines. So, uh, and, and I think that uh, a lot of Filipino students in law schools, they need to understand that you know, international is not some slick discipline that uh, will make us really cool, no? but international is a tool that we must use to understand ourselves and we need international law to be understood by Filipinos from uh, their own location. Um, uh, that will be my response to your question. Thank you. Yes, I think I, I think I would like to respond to the, the second point earlier mentioned by Barry on the context of, of public international law or international law as belonging to a few only in the Philippines. And I think we share the same idea as you have said earlier in, in other webinars that you had and I think that that is still true in, in the Philippines that the, the impression for international law is that it is for exceptional few, maybe because of the presentation of, of international law in law school that is primarily number one, bar oriented, that students would only study international law because they are, they, it is included in the bar examinations, maybe a one or two questions, maybe, maybe asked in the bar examinations for that, but but generally it's it's a two unit subject or if you add private international law, that's another two units out of 100 plus units in law school. Another one is practice. Maybe the Filipinos or, or some of the lawyers in the Philippines or law students would think that public inter international law has no real practice in the Philippines. You know that in, in the Philippines, the practice of lawyers is not that much of, of uh, of specialized, unlike in other jurisdictions, where here, uh, while it is general practice, no cases that would go to the regular law offices about international law, or maybe because the application of international law has intertwined already with the domestic application. So the domestic law is that which is being focused. But thankfully, of course, for globalization and the, the internet digitization of materials, online materials, for instance, and the opportunities that come out in, in the recent years, there are many opportunities that many lawyers would be interested to understand. And as Rommel has earlier said, and many of us as um, summarized by Melissa, the importance of international law at this time where the perspective is towards the world, then maybe Filipinos may rethink about that, maybe a subject in the mandatory continuing legal education um, as an increase in the number of units, which is as of right now, lawyers are required to, for compliance purposes, every three years, they are required two units of international law, maybe an increase of that, or maybe an international law that integrate that is integrated in other subjects, but looking at history or comparison or comparative uh, aspects of the law, then maybe um, this integration and this globalization has a big role in promoting international law in the Philippines. Uh, thank you both for your answers. Uh, I want to turn to one of the questions from one of our attendees. Um, Abigail raises an issue that was uh, mentioned by Rommel as well as John on the interdisciplinarity of teaching international law, the need for interdisciplinary approaches. So Abigail says, um, oh, I lost the question. <laughs> uh, how do we further decolonize the teaching of law in the Philippines such as that we also move towards language justice? Our laws are in English, previously in Spanish, and the current medium of instruction is English. However, when we finally practice, we're situated in local speech communities with different languages serving the educated and also the unlettered. Um, that's very true. Um, in fact, uh, 
take my example. I was born in Mindanao. My my father was from Central Visayas, he spoke Wara. My mother is from uh, Iloilo, she spoke in Iligayan. I we were we were taught the na Filipino the national language in school, English uh, as well. Uh, and when I was uh, preparing for for law school, I needed to take twelve units of Spanish. Uh, that was my time. But today they removed that requirement. Um, and uh, there are at, at, at least uh, 150 major uh, ethnic groups in the Philippines, but uh, but maybe nine that with more at least a million speakers. Uh, and it, it, you go to court. Uh, somebody who I I once uh, appeared in court where the defendant for kidnapping case spoke Tausu. Uh, he couldn't speak Tagalog or the national language, much much less English. So somebody was translating the questions from English to Tagalog, and someone has to, to translate the question from Tagalog to, to Tausu. Um, so, so, and that is reflected actually in the overall um, um, educational system. Uh, there are efforts to regionalize to teach uh, from the level of at the level of the primary schools, where uh, where students are taught um, of, uh, their their native their, their mother tongue. Uh, but that, that still does not really uh, address uh, much of the problem uh, because um, it seems to me, uh, having been born in the South, that uh, Tagalog, uh, Filipino is, is the language that, that is said to be national. Uh, but, uh, and uh, the model is supposed to be that, uh, you know, the native languages will have some contributions to Tagalog. Uh, but that, that, that's not how you actually do language justice. Language justice is that uh, when you go to school, if you're in, in if you're in Manila, for instance, you should be asked to learn at least one language from another part of the region. Whereas today, it's just you know you you go you, you're from Mindanao or you're from the Visayas, you have to learn Tagalog. But the uh, people in, in in Luzon are they're not required to learn other languages from other parts of, of the Philippines. So so that is really that just you know just one aspect of a bigger problem, uh, which. To some degree, yes, uh, to do also with colonialism, because that's what the Spaniards did also, uh, to divide and conquer, so that they could, oh, well, there were very few um, colonial uh, colonialists actually, and they couldn't cover the entire country. So that was one of their strategies. If I may, uh, Irene, uh, jump into the, to the, the discussions. Uh, I have a different perspective uh, uh, on uh, whether we should decolonize the teaching of law. To my mind, I think, uh, uh, we need to understand law from its colonial roots. And I think uh, decolonizing uh, the teaching of law would create somehow a problem on how we trace the history of our laws. And, and uh, uh, that might create a problem in the interpretation of law. But of course, it does not mean that the state should not uh, intervene in the process of making the law understood by the community. Because I think the question is on the colonization of teaching the law. Uh, I think that's going to be problematic in a country where it's actually a mixed legal system. So what should be done uh, in that context is I think for the government eventually to, to come up with laws, legal framework that would mandate the translation of laws into different language. And I think there's a need to, to uh, revisit the concept of uh, how we frame uh, ignorance of the law excuses no one. Uh, to my mind, I think that that's where the problem is because if the law is in English, how can that apply to somebody who does not speak English? So I think uh, there is a void in our, in our justice system that there's a need for, for, for the state to come up with, with an intervention that uh, laws are translated into vernaculars because we are a very multilingual country. So I think that's where uh, 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 the intervention should come in. Uh, government should uh, come up with affirmative actions to, to translate our laws before they are even uh, enforced in, in, um, uh, in local communities. Yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. I have so many views about this, but I don't want to take the, lim the, the light from our speakers. John, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, um, 
I, I discussed earlier the interdisciplinary approach to the teaching of international law, as well as multi-jurisdictional approaches. And um, the Philippines is, an, is in a very unique situation because be, due to our geographical configuration, um, Filipinos are in fact, in terms of everyday conversational uh, language, we are a multilingual people. And I think the educational system should, should encourage uh, multilingualism. And um, uh, it's, it's a step forward uh, in a post-colonial structure. Um, even if, uh, well, to a certain extent, I would, I, I would agree with, with um, Dean, Dean said about uh, uh, his, his, his view on decolonialism, but at, at the same time, um, we should not, um, well, we should not, we, we should not forget uh, uh, the mistakes of the past, even as we move forward. Um, those that do not remember the mistakes of the past are condemned to repeat them, but at the same time, we, we need to, to move forward and, and what, we cannot change our past but we can change our future. So it would depend upon the government uh, to try to, to encourage um, debate and discourse um, in many more languages. Of course, at, um, even, even our experience in law school, uh, there are many cases that are still in Spanish. The older cases are in Spanish. So oftentimes when case, when, when case law is assigned to us, we either have it in, 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 in Spanish or we, we translate it to possibly English. But uh, the point I, am make, I would like to make is this, uh, there, there is no harm with having two or three uh, languages as the official languages of a country. Of course, we need to promote a national language as as uh, as part of our our uh, our uh, our desire to achieve national unity. But at the same time, we cannot dissociate ourselves from uh, from the world. Um, in, in fact. In, in, in the United Nations, uh, the, the more seasoned diplomats are those who have learned many languages, many international languages spoken in the United Nations, uh, essentially English, uh, Spanish, and, and French, among others. But um, at this point, we cannot, uh, we cannot discourage uh, the use of language in, in, in whatever form. Each language is unique and each language is special. Um, insofar as I am concerned, I, I, I belong to, to the south of the Philippines, uh, uh, like Dean, Dean Z, Dean Nitokalan. And uh, uh, for my purposes, aside, aside from, from speaking uh, foreign languages, um, I in order for me to, to, to be able to, to, uh, uh, to travel in certain portions of the, of the country, I have, I have to speak um, uh, my, my uh, uh, other languages like, like Cebuano. Uh, I am a native uh, Kiligaynon uh, speaker. And of course, when I, when I go to Luzon, I also speak um, um, uh, Tagalog. But all these languages are a conglomeration of what, what, is, what is known as being Filipino. Uh, it's, it's not so much the, the nuances of the language, but, but rather uh, uh, the, the things that bring us together. Um, that is precisely the reason why um, uh, the National Commission on the Filipino Languages is encouraging incorporation of of, uh, of, of words from, from, from many different indigenous tongues. But um, uh, I think that the more successful countries in the world 
uh, although they, they should never forget their history, um, they, they, should, they, they should move forward. And in, in, in moving forward, they have to understand that their history is unique uh, to their people. And that, 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 unique, that uniqueness of, of that people will, will, will determine their, their destiny um, beyond the neo-colonial structure that, is, that was imposed on, on most countries. May, may I please? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, do, I, have a, I do struggle with the idea of decolonizing international law. International law is a tool of colonialism and imperialism, and students have to be taught that it is what it is. I am interested instead on globalizing the classroom, making the students attending a class on international law as diverse culturally, ethically, sexually, in, in every sense as diverse as possible. And it is only then, I think, that the students and the society where they are in can take control of the narrative of, of, of international law. It is rather pointless to be changing the language of international law. It is English, especially in the context of an ASEAN or Asia, which is seeking to universalize or regionalize the teaching of law. And therefore we are compelled to choose one language if we are going to facilitate that. But at the same time, we must, or if in my case, I would insist on a classroom that is as diverse as possible. Absolutely, yes, I, I completely agree with you. Joseph, do you have any thoughts about this? Because it's definitely one of the, I would think that, you know, language as well as literature kind of develops with the history um, of the nation. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about this um, issue. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming from a literature, um, in the literary field, um, I have always thought that, um, well, language is a very complex issue. And uh, when we talk about decolonization, we have to understand that um, language is, um, with language, it comes with culture. And uh, every time we use a language, we are actually also imbibing a particular culture. So we have to be con conscious of that. And when we go back to post-colonial studies, um, there was even a, propo uh, a proposal that um, to decolonize um, literature, education, there must be a rejection of, a, of the foreign language, like English. So although um, that, that, that kind of position has, has a point, um, um, especially during the um, early, early phase of post-colonialism. And it would really be difficult, I mean, to implement in terms of um, practicality from the point of view practicality because many of the the texts of international law it's it's written in english and of course one can argue that it can be translated but uh i think it's um my 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 position is um just like um what the other um panelists have um said um the, the more languages you have, the better. It's like a dialogue of languages. I think through that kind of um, process where all languages could play a part, um, I think that would more, um, uh, that could increase our understanding of international. So it's more like a, 
a, a multilingual, a more, more dialogical um, way of studying international law, not monolingual. I think there's always a problem with, with monolingual study of, in, of international law, just like um, study it in English or you, you, you have to, I think it's better that we have a more dialogical and multilingual study of um, international. That, that would make it really international in the in the strict sense of the word. So I think I would take that from like Bakhtin where a lot of languages are spoken. And when we go back to literature, actually in society, there are a lot of languages there. It's, it's really a more of a, um, a dialogue of languages, even when you are writing a novel or just like our novel, for instance, um, Jose Rizal's novel is written in Spanish. But if you read that novel written in the 19th century, you can practically read a lot of languages there from Spanish to the Tagalog to the Chinese way of speaking our local languages. So it's, it's really more complex than, than um, let us say, um, a monolingual um, language. I think international law is like that. It, it has no single language, although there might, might be a predominant language, but I think what we have to do is to make it more multilingual, to make it more dialogical so that um, other voices, other languages can also be heard. And so that is, I think, one way of decolonizing um, international law. I mean, very quickly. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I think a, a good model, I think, is the European Union, um, where uh, laws uh, are into different, translated into to different languages of the members of the European Union. Yes, th th this could could be a separate big discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, certainly, uh, your, your views are all very, uh, very interesting. And thank you for your input today and your presentations um, and the time you have put in uh, to uh, discuss these issues with us. Um, I want to uh, open the floor to Jean-Pierre, um, who will be thanking everyone, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to all of the speakers today. Um, thank you very much to Romel, who's been our contact point uh, for this panel um, over the last few months as we um, develop this webinar series. Um, and to once again, thank you, Irina, for um, your excellent sharing of, of this webinar today. And then just one quick reminder for our attendees um, that we have a second webinar today as part of the series, uh, as part of the series which is looking at critical perspectives on teaching international law. And that will start in at 1.30 UK time, which is in 35 minutes. So we do encourage you all to um, stay on the line and or sign off and sign back in, but to uh, join us back in about half an hour um, for that second webinar today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you again to all the speakers. Thank you, Irini. Thank you, Ramel. Um, and see you all in about half an hour. Thanks very much, Thank everyone. Very much. Thank you, Thank everyone. You.